some people are saying, oh, she sounds like Gita, she sounds like Guruji, <laughs> but you're very much yourself, clearly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for me, I've really enjoyed how you it's like you're shedding further light on everything I've learned from my teachers and from, you know, the times I've been into Pune. So to me, it's just really interesting that we can keep, that you can keep elucidating on this fantastic tradition that we have. So thank you. Thank you. It's easier this way. <laughs> I don't have to find out anything new. <laughs> Just open out what they've said. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> but your interpretations are different and your <laughs> translations are really good. And you don't shout at us. <laughs> <laughs> you have another day to go. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me to ask you this, but do you ever plan a class? No. Okay, that was easy. Uh, <laughs> Would you mind explaining to people, like some of the younger people, why we say G, why we say Guruji, why we add G to the name? <coughs> the suffix G um, denotes a respect. Like you add Sir in our uh, uh, tradition, the J-I is a mark of respect that you show to the elders. So the name followed by a J-I. Thanks. And so you've spoken a fair bit about learning at the feet of Guruji. Would you like to speak more about that? Or is it a never-ending subject? Yeah, I mean, everything that I'm doing is a reflection of learning under him. So I don't know where, to, where I will have to begin to answer that question. Um, what about Gita Ji? Could you tell us something about what you've learned from Gita Ji? <coughs> I am unable to separate what I've learned from Guruji, Gita Ji, or Prashant Ji because um, they have uh, amalgamated inside. I remember uh, Guruji in an interview telling someone, that he was the trunk of the tree and Gita and Prashant are my branches, he had said. So for those of us who learned from the three of them at the same time, it was indeed a blessing because they, even though they appeared to be different on the face of it, uh, the expression that they were teaching something different, for the receiver who sensitively could experience it, um, it was, uh, it, was uh, it led to the same um, goal or you know, the same direction. So learning from the three of them has, um, is now an amalgamated unit in me. So I cannot really separate what I've learned from her or him or uh, Guruji. Um, but definitely Gita Ji's contribution in the making of any teacher worldwide is immense. I just um, had a thought a couple, few months ago that if we had to delete all the vocabulary or expressions that Gita Ji has introduced in the system, not a single teacher would be actually able to stand to teach. <laughs> so that's been her contribution to everybody who's a teacher here. And you're a very different role model for us to Gita. You know, you're married, you have children, you don't shout. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God I'm not with my family here, so they can't give you another <laughs> version. <laughs> Um, do you ever do you ever feel self doubt when you come onto a stage? Uh, not these days. It was there in the beginning when I had first started to teach. I remember my first trip overseas, <laughs> and um, I was afraid. I was nervous, and I was telling Guruji that I don't think I'm ready, and I should not be going. Let me just teach the classes here. And he said no, because he had declined a few invitations before that when a few other countries had asked. At that time, he had said no, not yet. And at some point, he felt it is right. So I told him no, but there are so many people who are going to be in the classes there who have been learning from you even before I moved to Pune, Pune or learned from you. So I don't think it's fair that uh, they have to learn from me. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, what makes you think they are coming to learn from you? <laughs> They are coming to learn what I have taught you. <laughs> so that kind of eased the pressure. <laughs> so that's how it's been. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Guruji was a very godly man, even though he said yoga could be practiced without religion, and he, um, he explained God as an ideal concept for man to aspire to. 
What do you think is the role of the gods in yoga? I think that's a personal, um, it's a personal thing what each one feels about God. It's much easier to subdue the ego and um, surrender when there is belief in God. That's in one sense then God becomes a prop. Because to not have faith, whom do you surrender to? Where do you let go? Who do you go down to? So in that sense, God um, is, a, is a very powerful prop, if you look at it that way. Because ultimately, when, if you go by uh, Patanjali's definition of Ishwara, it is not one God. It is just the universal force or the universal energy, which is called pranava. Um, and it's, it's a personal uh, uh, feeling for each one. Uh, you, a way you choose perhaps to interpret things or if it works for you as a prop, you use it as a prop? Ultimately, even in uh, my religion, it says that it's not the external God that you know by different names that you aspire for. It, you go through them and ultimately you realize the antaratma or the universal consciousness which is within which doesn't have a form, which is not the God that we know of as Rama, Krishna, or any other religions, gods. It's a different entity altogether. The, the divinity within. And Prashant says we've got 330 million gods <laughs> living inside. <laughs> That's too many props. <laughs> um, and just going back to your background as a scientist, what was your PhD going to I be I didn't. In? I don't know. My master's, was, my master's was in bioinformatics. What is that? That is, I really don't know now. <laughs> 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 it was a new field back then. I was just the second batch in the University of Pune. It was computational biology. So they try to solve biological, um, they try to understand, unravel, solve, do all of that on the computer. <laughs> so you made a good choice. <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and so how does your science training affect your practice and your teaching? Hard to say again. It's difficult to pick out a thread like that. They say, it is said that everything that you face in life influences you in some way. So in that sense, it must have had a big impact. I remember Guruji remarking once to someone else that I'd have to teach her differently because she's from a science background and I would have to teach him differently because he's from an arts background. So he had that difference that he comprehended, but how I received it differently because of a science background, I don't know. Maybe I'm more, um, I need more logic um, evidences and take the shoulders back so the chest is up. I mean, I think that would be my linear equation when I started because it was difficult to break the linear dogma for a while, for a long while. Um, so that must have been, I don't know if it's, a co I can call it a contribution or a disadvantage. <laughs> It's a contribution, and I think it seems to be. I don't know. And then <laughs> when you said to us in the pranayama that it's really fascinating to you, you know, how can you get more breath? To me, that sort of is a scientific way of thinking mm -hmm. about things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what I really love too is how you do give us that tangible, you know, putting yes. our fingers in our ears. Is you make the philosophical really tangible and really easy for us to then pass it on to our beginners and our... That's good. That's good because I remember a session of practice and um, Guruji was teaching something and apparently I thought I got it but he didn't think so. <laughs> it was an intense uh, session going on and then he hit his heart and he said, how were you a university topper? <laughs> Um, uh, this is a question that came from the floor, mm. so if you wouldn't mind explaining what, what's your practice like. Do you practice like we were working today, the exercising kind of way? Or? Uh, on different days it is different. 
um, it depends upon what um, many times it depends upon what I'm feeling, what the diagnosis of my condition is. Like if once I go back because I've not had uh, satisfaction, I want to say sat significant practice that I've done here in these five days. So when I go back, I think there'll be more of a recovery mode that I would do. Um, post the ankle, post the cast removal, it was directed towards that. So depending upon what's going on, obviously the practice will be impacted. But those few times when there is no external source which is going to dictate what needs to be done, sometimes it is just picking up what's, been, what's not been done for a long while. Sometimes um, if I had read up something about Guruji uh, on his books or Gitaji Prashantji's articles or interviews, Sometimes it goes on to explore that. So there's no one standard way. So you don't do the back bends one day, like you were saying? Uh, I have done that in the past, but not now. Um, uh, how, how do you think the guru sisya student teacher relationship translates into today's world? For me, uh, having been brought up in the cultural framework of India itself, the word guru and the word shishya mean a lot more rather than being just a teacher and a student relationship. So when you're talking about uh, in the current world, it'll again depend upon the cultural context of who I'm addressing. Um, one thing that I struggled with a lot many years ago was to, because when, um, one thing I struggled to comprehend initially a few years ago, many years ago was, is it the subject that one teaches that makes one a guru? Because I think that is the notion in the Western world that if somebody is teaching yoga, then that person is a guru. And if somebody is teaching chemistry or English, that person is a teacher. Uh, first thing is even according to the traditional um, uh, cont notions, that is not the case. It is not the subject that you teach. So there would be an instructor in yoga and there can be a guru who's teaching English or maths. Because what that teacher does to you defines whether that person is a guru or a teacher. So that's about the principle of guru. But uh, ultimately it is said that um, the ultimate guru is, the, is, a, is a principle. For us now with Guruji's passing, Guruji becomes a prop for us to get connected to that eternal principle of Guru. But that is the traditional th uh, notions of it. For uh, comprehensible purposes, if you ask me what is the role of Guru Shishya, I think it's little be contemporarily better to think about the role of teacher-student to start off, because that itself is fading. So Guru Shishya is still far away. So where so many options are available, the students also go window shopping with the teachers. Um, teachers have different um, people that they pick up as students. So if that relationship itself can be established and can be progressive, I think we would have made a big, um, uh, covered a big step towards Guru Shishya in this contemporary world. And the role of the Guru, guru is bringing from darkness to light, is that? Yeah, but if I were to ask you, what is darkness to light? That's we switch off the light and <laughs> switch it on. So what do we mean by darkness to light is another topic in itself altogether. Just so just thinking when we're meant, when we are looking for our own guru or do we look for it or it just arises? They say guru appears. Okay. And with uh, definitely with Guruji around, I wholeheartedly see Guruji as my guru. So uh, I didn't go to him as a guru, like I told you the story yesterday. When I came to Pune, I just wanted to see what yoga is and why the whole world is coming to my grandfather. So he was a grandfather to me. And he didn't become a guru because he taught me a few things. It didn't happen like that. It, it, uh, it, it was a phase. Again, I can't pinpoint when he stopped being a teacher and he became a guru or when he stopped being a grandfather and became a guru. I think it was uh, an intermingled, um, phenomenon, especially grandfather guru. But from teacher to guru, it happens somewhere down the line, can't pinpoint when. But it's not something that I sought, it happens. 
And uh, uh, you're training teachers now at Rimi. And is trying. that right? Trying. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather didn't like the word trying. So <laughs> he said, you do. What do you mean you try? You either do or you don't. <laughs> There's nothing called try. The word is void. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips on training teachers? <laughs> Many. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a few. I've given, I'm, I'm giving. Okay, <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> You're giving all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, this, uh, I wasn't sure whether to ask this or not, but um, many Iyengar teachers in Australia either have to be independently wealthy or forego good incomes in other professions to run Iyengar yoga schools. In the past, we were told if we wanted to be real teachers, we needed to commit ourselves full fully and teach yoga full-time. Do you think that still applies? No. I don't think it's uh, feasible these days. It probably was not feasible those days, but there were a lot of people who did that. So my respects and appreciation goes out to them. Um, especially post, not especially, significantly post COVID, it was a realization, you know, that um, we can't take things for granted. That's number one. But financial uh, difficulties, financial issues were always there and will continue to be there. So if someone is giving up on all that and is in yoga, okay, great, but survival, having enough to make ends meet is a must. So if that means that another profession has to be there, let it be there. I think it's better that the money um, is taken care of so that when you're in yoga, at least at that time, you can divert your thoughts towards yoga. Because if you only depend upon yoga for money, if you get it, great. But if you don't get it, then while in yoga, so, so many things about the money is going to play a role. And that's a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, in 2018 at Yoga Nushasanam, Gita Ji spoke about Abhinavesha. And she said, you know, the instinctive clinging to life. And she said, you know, for example, our knee pain can be a, manif a manifestation of that. So it's not really that we're, it's the knee, it's the pain in the knee that we're act reacting to, but what lies underneath that is really the fear of death <laughs> and, and our own mortality. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> she said it, so she must be correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Okay. Uh, you've also said that the love... I'm sorry, I'm not helping you to... No, 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 <laughs> that's okay. We, it's really good. We're going to finish right on time or early. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's one. Is it reasonable to learn from one teacher? Depends on which context. You know, in which context this question is coming. I is think it, it might be as a... I don't know, but a lot of teacher trainers... When you're training as a teacher, we ask people to just learn from one teacher while they're doing their teacher training. Okay. Is it reasonable if the uh, 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 teacher is really a teacher? Yes, it is reasonable. It, it'll work. But the condition here is the teacher has to really be a teacher. <laughs> That's a big essay, no? Who, who's a teacher? Because you, have, you can have instructors of asanas. You can have someone who conducts a class. They are different. You have someone teach a class. It is different. So on the um, if it has to be a one-line answer, if the student-teacher relationship is good, if the teacher is really teaching according to the principles of Iyengar Yoga, according to the method laid down by Guruji, yes. And how can we attract young people to Iyengi Yoga? When was this question submitted? Because Which I gave one? some clues today morning. Yeah, uh, we've answered that one. Just jump around a lot, it appears <laughs> to be. <laughs> uh, what do you see as your direction for Iyengi Yoga?
to give, to share what I have received from the three of them. And I sincerely feel that it is so much. And what I give is just a small part of it. So if such a small part of it is really being so much valued, then the real stuff, you know, must be having so much more. And uh, my three uh, gurus have really given, given me and given all the students who were around them so selflessly that um, I just feel lucky to have been there at that point. I really didn't do anything to deserve the wealth of knowledge that they have given. Was just lucky to be there. So um, I really feel I should continue or I should um, play my role in this parampara by my candle has been lit by them. So it is my responsibility to light other candles. You, I think, I think we're all burning bright at the moment. Wonderful. Thanks to you. <laughs> um, you've said that the love we have for yoga is conditional. Say that again. Uh, the you've you've said I saw a video of you on YouTube okay. saying. <laughs> <laughs> I can recommend it. Uh, that the that the love we have for yoga is conditional. Uh -huh. It was your Hanuman talk. I and see. So, like, <laughs> conditions apply. <laughs> <laughs> we love yoga, but conditions <laughs> apply. And, um, but you are encouraging us to be more like Hanuman. Can you just give Speak people about a that? little... Yeah. Now, I think the context was it was Hanuman Jayanti, and for those who know the story of Hanuman, he was a selfless devotee of Ram. He never thought about his safety, what will happen to him, what is right, what is wrong. If Ram said it, that's it. That, that was the mantra and that had to be done. So it was unconditional love that he had for Rama. So um, that was, so Hanuman is, one of, is the epitome of bhakti in our uh, culture. So in that uh, context, I think I compared ourselves as to what we can learn from Hanuman on Hanuman Jayanti. Why is Hanuman Jayanti celebrated by the institute? What is it that we can get from the story of Hanuman? Uh, see, any birthday, if it's Guruji's birthday, you're inspired to learn some, you know, to do, to do what he stood for. On Guruji's birthday, you may not miss practice. Maybe you will miss practice on other days, but not on Guru Purnima or Guruji's birthday. That's the emotion that is evoked. So on Hanuman Jayanti, that emotion is what I must have uh, been referring to, that our uh, love is so conditional, not just in yoga, anywhere, relationships, things that we choose to do. It all depends upon what we get in return. So even in our relationships, um, as long as the other person is um, uh, amiable or you know agreeable to what you're saying, it works. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Whereas love is said to be a supreme um, emotion. In fact, it is one, it's a primordial feeling. So it is an emotion in which there is no if this is. So I was referring to that emotion to say that towards yoga, if we can have that, if we can be inspired to have that kind of, an, of a perspective. Beautiful, thank you. And I learned this the hard way though. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> tell more. <laughs> um, there were two um, incidents separately, but I remember them together. One thing is uh, Guruji was teaching me Urdhva Mukhashmanasan, and um, I had to drag my feet forward. And obviously beyond a the point, there is a fear of falling. You know? So you, f you feel like you're going to topple. And so at that point, we stopped. So he, he was saying that it is not the body which is stopping you, it is your fear that you're going to fall that is stopping you from dragging your feet forward. It's not about your tailbone or lower back or shoulder blades, it's here. So I was trying to drag my feet forward, forward, but at the point where I felt that I'm going to fall on my face, I stopped. <laughs> and, and he got uh, really angry at that point. And I, it was, I was, I think, newly married back then. And he said, um, 
just go. If you fall on your face, you fall, you break your teeth. You anyway married, right? You're already married now. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you break your teeth. <laughs> and uh, subsequently, after a couple of years, there was another um, lesson that must have been similar. I only remember his response right now. And he said, um, you love only your husband. You don't love yoga at all. I loved my wife, but I also loved yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, you've sort of answered this already, but um, it's just interesting to note that the Latin root of the word tradition it, it means to hand over or to hand down, mm -hmm. the same as the Sanskrit word parampara. Mm. Um, uh, so how do we honor and maintain the Iyengar tradition? Like I told you, it's so easy for me to answer these questions because <laughs> I was lucky enough to have been there and I've heard him say it. <laughs> so, another diversion. <laughs> there was once this um, ex-CBI um, officer. CBI is um, Central Bureau of Investigation. You know, these detectives that solve high-profile cases, governmental uh, crimes kind of. So this ex-officer was going to come to the institute. And he had spoken with Guruji that he has this issue, he has that issue. So Guruji told me after the practice session that you take these props down or keep it ready because we'll come with him to the hall. And he has to do setuban like this. He will not have time, so I'll show you what is to be done. So see it now only, don't waste time later. So that was done. And then he told me to do something else and that he has to do that. <laughs> and then he winked and he said, you tell him to do. He will think that you're intelligent and you're teaching him. He won't know that I'm telling you <laughs> what all has to be done. <laughs> so that's exactly what's happening right now. It's <laughs> fantastic. You're doing a great job. <laughs> so to answer the question, though, Guruji, Guruji was asked what he saw as the future of Iyengar Yoga, where it was going to be after him, after years. And he said that if my, t I teach, um, I teach the people the sensitivity. I'm don't not quoting verbatim. Huh? I'm um, composing. Yeah. Uh, so sensitivity is what I'm instilling in my students, and that sensitive awareness will guide, will will um, ignite the light of yoga in them. And he said, if my teachers can give to their students this sensitivity then the flame of yoga will go on. Beautiful. <laughs> we all have to try <laughs> hard to do that. Um, just on the, the changes to the assessment and the changes to the culture, can you just speak about how you want the culture to change? Or I know it's kind of happening already. <laughs> <coughs> when we thought about it in 2019, uh, it, 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 the discussion had started way back in 2015-16 itself. Um, so Gita Ji had given a lot of ideas. Unfortunately, Gita Ji, uh, with Gita Ji's passing, it took us another year before we could uh, present it. Um, the idea was that we have to make it um, contemporary with Guruji, Gita Ji, both no more. Um, certain things have to be adapted, made flexible to, to uh, align with today's world. Like back then, if students had a problem, you know, when he started teaching, think about 60s, 70s, and if any student would have had a question, they would have written to Guruji and would have taken a month probably for the letter to reach. Guruji sends a response, it will have taken a month for the reply to reach, and in those two months, so much might have changed in the student. So when communication was like that, or even when the senior teachers, when I met them, they were reminiscing about their times in Pune, when if they had to call back their family, they would have to go to a telephone booth somewhere in Pune, make a call, etc. So in, in this day and age, communication is so um, easy at the tip of a finger. Um, the knowledge in the form of information is out there. 
so we have a lot of uh, resources, and that's one thing I've, I've seen uh, Alan Good's library. So things like that, digital libraries that should be made available to people because all of that information is going to contribute by leaps and bounds to a student's journey. So when that is the case, somewhere we'll have to make amends because it's a different world right now. That's number one. Number two, the devotion that people might have felt towards a guru will no longer be here because they are no longer there. So we cannot expect the same devotion, the same dedication from an emotional perspective. So something else has to change so that the sensitivity quotient in them is ripened. Because back then, if you would just see Guruji here, your Trikonasana would change. That is not going to happen anymore. So there are these external factors that have so drastically changed over the years that we thought we should change this. Another thing was that uh, in the previous system, it was Guruji's system that he made, and it is a splendid uh, um, um, uh, ladder that Guruji has given. So as it was mentioned many times in 2019 and in subsequent interactions that I've had with various associations, that we are not deleting or negating the certification structure that Guruji had laid down. That has to be your reference. So even though so many asanas from, say, junior one, two, three, junior two and three and senior one may have combined to form a certain level. You have this skeleton, that is your study material, your practice uh, methodology to come to this. So this is not invalid right now, it's a subset of this. So right now you have to open this and this much more. Guruji has written Light on Life, which was not available when um, the previous certification structure was laid out. So if a per in fact, I believe that Light on Life should be the first book that should be read for level one because it is talking so much practically what spirituality is. So when all this has changed, and that is today's world, the idea was to make the certification system to uh, align with this. And to make the system friendlier, etc., to lessen the fear, because with fear we really cannot learn. So this system, after 10, 15 years, may become redundant, and maybe something else will have to change. We just have to be receptive, be open, to sense when it is time to do that, and have the courage to do that. Yeah, so we move more away from fear and more to love. <laughs> when you saw them, you felt the love already. Now we'll have to remove the obstacles to feel the love. <laughs> And that's right. And, okay, final question. Okay. Um, what's your interpretation of Guruji's words, let my ending be your beginning? Mm -hmm. Again, to continue from the previous answer, or I think I mentioned it yesterday also, that he uh, has given so much, he's led to this point. So if we can start off from this point, we are going to be ahead by so many kilometers. We, you know, I remember <laughs> her, uh, when he was teaching me so many asanas, uh, and he was telling the teachers generally that, do you know how I learned this, doing between two columns, struggling with rocks, struggling with stones? He said, you have no clue how many years I have saved for you. <laughs> how many years I've saved for you. What uh, uh, people probably learn in Baddha Konasan, if you have to bring the thighs down and you have probably had to work for eight months, 10 months to get them down, and now you keep the weights every day for a month and it's going to go down. Just a simplistic example that I'm giving. So in that sense, he has saved um, our um, um, efforts, which otherwise we would have had to put in to discover and explore so many things. So I think even just the literal meaning of that itself is giving um, so much uh, value that he has shown us yoga, what yoga is here, and he says, make this your starting point to go even further. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for your generosity. Welcome. Thanks for... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think Helen, Helen's got something for you. Here comes Helen. And thanks for leaving your family and the institute <laughs> and to come and teach us. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed.
Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here.